Wheresoever the body shall be, there the eagles also be gathered together. Words from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Allegorically, St. Ambrose and other fathers and doctors of the church hold that the body mentioned here in the gospel is that of the church. And the eagles are spiritual persons of heavenly life and doctrine. They are the faithful of Christ who strive to know him, to love him, and to serve him with their whole mind, heart, soul, and strength. Now, St. Jerome adds that we may understand by the carcass here, or corpse, which in the Latin is more expressively cadaver, an allusion to the passion of the Christ's death. Now, bringing these two concepts together, we could conclude that the church, the body of Christ, will go through a passion and become prostrate, seemingly dead. That's the body, the cadaver. Yet, at the same time, the faithful will flock to her like eagles and will find consolation her in times of great trial as expressed in the gospel today. So, there's going to have to be eagles. We'll have to become eagles to know the church, to come to her and gather together with her. Now, this is one of those times. This is one of those times. All those whose faith is operating know that the church is suffering from many wounds in this our day. She is in a passion. We've quoted this many times and it's good to quote it again. Listen to Pope Pius XI in his encyclical on the reparation due to the sacred heart of Jesus. This is paragraph 14. The expiatory passion of Christ is renewed... And in a manner continued and fulfilled in his mystical body, which is the church. Okay, the expiatory passion of Christ is renewed, it is continued, and it is fulfilled in his mystical body, which is the church. Pope Pius XI, thank you. Christ, the head, and the church, his body, they cannot be separated. They are one. Where the head has gone, the body must follow. Thus, if the Son of Man was lifted up so that men could be saved and have eternal life, so to the church. So to the church. The lightning that shines from east to west is the light of God shining upon his church that all may see it, know it, and enter it. If the Son of Man was lifted up so that men would be saved and have eternal life, so to the church and so to her members. We need to be lifted up. If our Lord went through a passion, so must the church. If our Lord went through a passion, so must his body. And when this happens, it seems that the faithful must become eagles in order to find her and gather around her to seek refuge from the confusion and darkness reigning at that time. I repeat, this is one of those times. In order to make the passion of the church more real to ourselves, if that is necessary, consider that the saints wonderfully mirrored some aspect of the church in their lives. That's why we look to them. They give us examples in their very bodies and souls and their lives of what is going on in the church around them. They show us how to live in certain times. Or we could say that in every age, the saints are emblems of the church, displaying in their very lives what she is passing through at that time or what she is to pass through shortly. This is hinted at in the sacred scriptures. When St. Paul says, if one member suffers anything, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member glory, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let us then look at one saint 
who lived in the 15th century, 1400s, when the church was going through a terrible passion, not unlike our own. In fact, we could say that she was at the very beginning of the revolution that is now coming to an end. Thus, she is very important because she represented at the very beginning what was going to happen all throughout and even more so at the end. The envelope was opening at her time and it's closing in our time. The saint I have in mind is the victim soul from Holland, from Scheidem, named Lydwin. Saint Lydwin. During her life, the church and the various states of Christendom were going through a terrible crisis of leadership. Imagine that, a crisis in leadership. She lived during the Great Western Schism, in which there were even two anti-popes at one point. It would seem that there were three popes to many people, and they didn't know which one was which. Witchcraft spread in many places. Various religious orders fell into corruption. Heresies spread here and there. Wycliffeites, Hussites, the forerunners of Martin Luther and company. Many priests live shameful lives. Kings and queens acted in scandalous ways in front of everyone. Wars were fought and blood shed for nearly nothing. Christians fought each other instead of the infidel in the Holy Land. During this time, St. Lydwin was born painlessly on Palm Sunday in 1380. Even as the Passion of Christ was being chanted in the local church, she was born painlessly. She grew to become a very beautiful young lady who vowed her virginity to our blessed Lord. Because her beauty began to cause problems with the possibility of marriage, she prayed that it be taken away. Her prayer was answered. Attacked by an illness, her beauty and strength began to fade such that no one sought her hand any longer. Being coaxed by her friends, To get out of the house and go ice skating, it was the little ice age in Holland. She fell and broke a rib. She was 15 years old. Taking to her bed, she remained there for the rest of her life. 38 years. 38 years unable to walk or move. Her mysterious illness, aggravated by the broken rib at first thought to be of natural causes, was soon discovered to have supernatural origins. In other words, God had a special design on this saint. He wanted her to do something for him. I want you to typify my church. I want you to be an emblem of the church. What a calling. This came only after she endured many painful and useless man-made remedies and medicines. Doctors came from all over. They wanted to see if they could help this mysterious woman. What was truly amazing was that she had every known disease and ailment of the time except leprosy. God did not want her to be put into a leper colony, so he didn't let her get that one. Amazingly, I know it sounds fantastic, she would not die. No part of her body was whole. She had ulcers, tumors, cancers, and even worms, and lots of them. Her right arm shriveled up and became useless, but still painful. One of her eyes failed her, and she often wept tears of blood. She would easily fall to pieces, literally, and therefore had to be wound up in a sheet when moved, lest she fall apart. And think of it, she would not, could not die. 
What is more, she could not eat food nor sleep. In 38 years, she only slept about three nights worth and ate about three meals. She could only eat the Eucharist. Now, does this sound incredible? Fantastic? Yet all of this was documented by the officials of the town, even by noblemen and kings and their courtiers, doctors, as well as three reputable priests, including Thomas Akempis, the author of The Imitation of Christ. No, this is real. But why? God wanted us to see what his suffering church looked like in a victim soul. And there have been many such victim souls in the history of the church. All the way from her time down to our own, you can find them, as well as before her time, that did many similar things. At first, St. Lydwin became depressed and self-absorbed with all her unexplained sufferings and her inability to die or to recover. Now, can imagine that? I can't die. I can't recover. I can't eat. I can't sleep. <laughs> What's going on? This self-pity went on for four long years. Imagine a teenage girl in such a predicament. It must have been an utter torture. Her father was her greatest support at the time. A good priest finally came to help her and explain to her what it all meant. He insisted that she meditate on the passion. Are you struggling with what's going on at the church right now? Meditate on the passion. Who was her strong support? Her father. Fatherhood is important at this time. This good priest insisted that she meditate on the Passion. After repeated tries, she finally obeyed, and the teenager became an eagle very quickly, able to fly to soaring heights that we find hard to imagine. God always rewards those who are willing to suffer with Him. Many angels and saints, as well as our Lord Himself, came to her bedside to help her soar. At times, she left her poor, dilapidated body on the bed to go on trips to Eden, the Garden of Eden, to contemplate and speak with various saints. Or she would go to purgatory or to various churches in Christendom with her guardian angel. After receiving these wings of an eagle, she said, If the recitation of a single Hail Mary would avail me a cure... I would not recite it. Imagine that. One Hail Mary and you'll be cured. No, I won't do it. What does all this mean? Let us reflect on a few points of contact. First, in her body, she represented the passion of the church in her time. But in her soul, she could soar to Eden. Representing the church in her indefectibility, her purity, her goodness. Thus, in her body, she was covered with wounds, tumors, cancers, diseases of all sorts, worms, and whatnot. And yet she would not die. These diseases represent all the heresies, errors, and corruption of those claiming to be her priests, her religious, and her members. To emphasize the fact that the church was in a passion, our Lord also gave her his stigmata so that she could fill up in her body what was lacking to the sufferings of Christ. And she did that. What is more, she added her own mortifications. Believe it or not, she added her own mortifications, unbelievable, unto those that were already present. Here's someone who understood the ways of God. As a result, her sufferings became the source of life for many who came to her, and she helped countless souls get out of purgatory. Once she realized her calling and her place, she wanted to remain. 
How about us? How many of us seem to regret having to be alive at this time? Why me? Why couldn't I live during a more peaceful time? Is this not so because we have failed or hurt the church in some way? Is that not why we're thinking like that? How selfish we are. How unwilling to help the church in her passion. St. Lydwin, pray for us. Help us meditate upon the passion. St. Lydwin was virginal and pure. What is more, even though she was rotting in her body, she admitted a most fragrant odor. By some accounts, she is the most fragrant of all the saints. Some said they could even taste the spicy fragrance emanating from her holy body. Her fragrance was so powerful that just smelling it moved many sinners to repentance. It stirred their conscience. Her voice was also sweet and kind. She was patient with all her visitors, even when they attacked her, and attack her they did. Some spread nasty rumors about her. Imagine that. Others belittled her to her face and even attacked her physically, causing her yet more wounds. So we see in this saint that even if the church looks as if she is prostrate upon her deathbed, a cadaver, being attacked and belittled by the press and the world, she is very much alive and well and waiting for her time of resurrection like a butterfly coming forth from its cocoon. She cannot die even when attacked by every kind of disease, ailment, or worms. When the saint did die, her body returned to her former beauty with no signs of age or any of the nasty elements her poor body suffered those 38 years. Also, St. Lydwin shows how the church is still able to reach out to anyone who comes to her, providing them with the solutions they need to find peace. St. Lydwin saved some from suicide. She helped many save their marriages, even when all appeared totally lost. She saved the town from attacks and various disasters, when hypocrites and liars came to her, she exposed them. She received very little support from the priests and even much persecution. Even though she could only eat the Eucharist, it's all she could hold down. <laughs> Imagine, they rarely communicated her. They neglected her. She had to wait four years for God to send her faithful priest that eventually guided her to become an eagle. God always works through his priests. He always works through his priests. So we must not tear down the priesthood due to the failures of some priests. Various priests and prelates are very much hurting the church. Yes, that is true. But we must not despair or despise them. This is a very important lesson given to us by St. Lydwin. She never attacked them nor disparaged them. In fact, when she found them in purgatory, the very ones that were hurting her on earth, she did everything she could to get them out of there. She never said, you deserve that. At times, various saints and angels visited her to urge her to pray and to suffer for some poor sinner. This is amazing. Little saint in Holland. Once, even the four great Western doctors of the church, St. Gregory, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, and St. Ambrose, came to her bedside in order to save a sinner who had an unconfessed sin. The saints do care. The church is served by her saints. Heaven is aware 
The church is one. We are loved. From this wonderful saint, we can learn many lessons about the church when she is in a passion. She shows us the path to becoming an ego. We too must meditate on the passion to avoid becoming self-absorbed or feeling sorry for ourselves or even angry that this is happening to me in my days. She shows us to love our station in life and to realize it is rather a privilege to live in such a time as this, to be at the foot of the cross when Christ is lifted up in his church and to be lifted up with him in some way or other. She shows us that we must rely on the priesthood, come what may. This is a priestly universe. There is no other path. God let her fall nearly into despair until he finally sent her a good priest. Such are the days of a passion. She shows us that our Lord begins by making his followers suffer and explains himself afterward, not before. I want you to live by faith. I'm not going to tell you ahead of time. You're going to do it out of faith. I'll tell you later. And on the last day, it'll all make sense. Trust. Live by faith. Such are the days of a passion. She shows us that our Lord begins by making his followers suffer. Think of Job. God made him suffer first. Then he explained to a certain degree, but never gave him all the reasons. The great thing then is to submit to God first and claim the rewards afterward. How many today seek out easy solutions? They want to know everything. They want to know solutions, these easy solutions which are all wrong. One can easily think of the set of contests. They want the quick answer. And there may not be one until the end. What we need today are more saints that are willing to suffer with the church and to fill up what is lacking in their own bodies so that more souls will be saved. Only generous saints, eagles, eagles like these can preserve us from the cataclysms to come. Wheresoever the body shall be, there shall the eagles also be gathered together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.